Um, so I'm Linda Toronto. Uh, that introduction was lovely and wrong. Um, I didn't write an article for the Huffington Post. I was having a chat with my friends on Gawker. Um, it was actually a conversation, but I'm super wordy, and it's actually considered really rude in Gawker forums to leave a three-page long comment and like have text wall, for those of you that are group people. Um, so you go back, you just write this thing, and then you link to something else. What actually started this was I was supposed to have been off work at 9 p.m. at IHOP in Washington, Utah. That's where I'm from. And um, I'm a pacer. I'm so sorry, camera guy, hi. Um, <laughs> So I was supposed to be getting off work at 9 p.m. The closing cook was supposed to come in. He couldn't make it. I'm stuck at work until midnight. This is in the winter in Utah with an hour's drive home through the mountains, snow and deer. I was heavily caffeinated by the time I got home. And I hopped online, and one of my friends, a woman I know to be good, a woman that I've known and spoken with for over a year, says, you know, I was at the store today, and uh, I know I'm an upper-middle-class white lady, and I'm not supposed to judge, but... I saw an iPhone and a Snap card, and somebody remind me why I'm not supposed to be angry about that. And me, well, um, I had thoughts. And I, I wrote them down and I published them. And before I tell you what those thoughts were, just in case you missed it, because I don't assume that everybody in the world has read my stuff, although sometimes it's really starting to feel like it, I want to make one thing perfectly clear. I would not be standing on this stage if I were not young and able-bodied and white. That is the first thing that we need to be real clear on, guys, because if I were a black woman, I would have been way too damn angry. And if I had been in a wheelchair, nobody would have believed that I could have been that hard of a worker. And if I'd been 50, nobody would have believed I could have worked the internet. <laughs> I am up here specifically because no matter how bad it was for me, I am one of the most privileged people in the world. I am a young, able-bodied, intelligent, white American. You don't do much better than that, no matter how damn bad the electric bill's getting. It's the first thing that we need to make clear because we too frequently don't say that. And we too frequently don't reach behind us and say, hey, you know what's really unfair? I got a big ass platform. Everybody got to be up here with me. So before I go further, I have a website. It's called bootstrapindustries.com. If you have a story, please publish it. I'll help you edit it. If you want a video up, let me know, dude. We got editors. We got producers. That's what we do for a living. We are here to make sure that all of us have a voice and not just the young, cute white girls, all right? Also, I'm super nervous, and I do like Marco Rubio level of water, so I'm sorry. <laughs> the thing I wrote in response to the woman who wanted to know why she was not allowed to judge somebody who had an iPhone and food stamps, called Why I Make Terrible Decisions, or Poverty Thoughts. There's no way to structure this coherently. The random observations that might help explain the mental processes, but often I think we look at the academic problems of poverty and we have no idea of the why. We know the what and the how, and we can see systemic problems, but it's rare to have a poor person actually explain it on their own behalf. So this is me doing that, sort of. Rest is a luxury for the rich. I get up at 6 a.m., I go to school, I have a full course load, but I only have to go to two in-person classes. I get to work, I get the kids, I pick up my husband, I have half an hour to change and go to job two. I get home from that at around midnight, then I have the rest of my classes and work to tend to. I'm in bed by three. This isn't every day because I have two days a week off from each of my obligations. I use that time to clean the house and soothe my husband and see the kids for longer than an hour and catch up on schoolwork. Those nights I'm in bed by midnight, but if I go to bed too early, I won't be able to stay up the other nights, but I drive an hour home from job two so I can't afford to be sleepy. I never get a day off from work unless I'm fairly sick. It doesn't leave you much room to think about the, what you're doing, only to tend to the next and the next. Planning isn't in the mix. When I was pregnant the first time, I was living in a weekly motel. I had a mini fridge with no freezer and a microwave. I was on WIC. I ate peanut butter from the jar and frozen burritos because they were 12 for $2. Had I had a stove, I could not have made burritos that cheaply, and I needed the meat because I was pregnant. I might not have had any prenatal care, but I am intelligent enough to eat protein and iron while I'm knocked up. I know how to cook. 
I had to take home ec to graduate from high school. Most people on my level didn't. Broccoli is intimidating. You have to have a working stove and pots and spices, and you'll have to do the dishes no matter how tired you are or they'll attract bugs. It is a huge new skill for a lot of people. That's not great, but it's true. We have learned not to try too hard to be middle class. It never works out well and always makes you feel worse for having tried and failed yet again. It's better not to try because it makes more sense to get food that you know will be palatable and cheap and that keeps well. Junk food is a pleasure that we're allowed to have. Why would we give that up when we have so few of them? The closest Planned Parenthood to me is three hours. That's a lot of money in gas. Lots of women can't afford that, and even if you live one, you probably don't want to be seen coming in and out in a lot of areas. We're aware that we're not having kids, we're breeding. We have kids for much the same reasons that I imagine rich people do urge to propagate and all. Nobody likes poor people procreating, but they judge abortion even harder. Convenience food is just that, and we are not allowed many conveniences. Especially since the Patriot Act passed, it's hard to get a bank account. But without one, you spend a lot of time figuring out where to cash a check and get money orders to pay bills. Most motels now have a no credit card, no room policy. I wandered around San Francisco for five hours in the rain once with nearly $1,000 cash on me and could not rent a room even if I gave them a $500 deposit and surrendered my cell phone to the desk to hold a surety. Nobody gives enough thought to depression. You have to understand that we know that we will never not feel tired, we will never feel hopeful, we will never get a vacation ever. We know that the very act of being poor guarantees that we will never not be poor and it doesn't give us much room to improve ourselves. We don't apply for jobs because we know we can't afford to look nice enough to hold them. I'd make a super legal secretary, but I have been turned down more than once because I don't fit the image of the firm. I am good enough to cook the food hidden away in the kitchen, but my boss won't make me a server because I don't fit the corporate image. I am not beautiful. I have missing teeth and skin that looks like it will when you live on B12 and coffee and nicotine and no sleep because beauty is a thing that you get when you can afford it and that's how you get the job that you need in order to be beautiful. There isn't much point trying. Cooking attracts roaches. Nobody realizes that. I have spent a lot of hours impaling roach bodies and leaving them out on toothpick pipes to discourage others from entering my house. <laughs> it doesn't work, but does amuse you. Free only exists for rich people. It's great that there's a bowl of condoms at my school, but most poor people will never set foot on a college campus because we don't belong there. There's a clinic, great, there's still a copay, and we're not going. Besides, all they'll tell you at the clinic is that you need to see a specialist which seriously might as well be located on Mars for how accessible it is. Low cost and sliding scale sounds like money you have to spend to me, and they can't actually help you anyway. I smoke, it's expensive, it's also my best option. You see, I am always, always exhausted, and it's a stimulant. When I am too tired to walk one more step, I can smoke and go for another hour. When I am enraged and beaten down and incapable of accomplishing one more thing, I can smoke and I feel better, a little better, just for a minute. It's the only relaxation I'm allowed. It's not a good decision, but it's the only one I have access to, and it's the only thing I've ever found that keeps me from collapsing or exploding. I make a lot of poor financial decisions. None of them matter in the long term. I'll never not be poor, so what does it matter if I don't pay a thing and a half this week instead of just one thing? It's not like the sacrifice is gonna result in improved circumstances. The thing holding me back isn't that I blow five bucks at Wendy's. It's that now that I've proven that I'm a poor person, that is all that I am or ever will be, and it is not worth it to me to live a bleak life devoid of small pleasures so that one day I can make a single large purchase. I will never have large pleasures to hold on to. There's a certain pull to live what bits of life you can while there's money in your pocket because no matter how responsible you are, you're gonna be broke in three days anyway. When you never have enough money, it ceases to have meaning. I imagine having a lot of it's the same thing. Poverty is bleak and it cuts off your long-term brain. It's why you see people with four different baby daddies instead of one because you grab a bit of connection wherever you can to survive. You have no idea how strong the pull to feel worthwhile is. It's more basic than food. You go to these people who make you feel lovely for an hour that one time, and that's all you get. You're probably not compatible for them for anything long term, but right this minute, they can make you feel powerful and valuable, and it doesn't matter what will happen in a month because whatever happens in a month is going to be just about as indifferent as whatever happened today or last week. None of it matters. It's best not to hope. You just take what you can get as you spot it. I am not asking for sympathy. 
I'm just trying to explain on a human level how it is that people make from what look like from the outside like awful decisions. This is what our lives are like, and here are our defense mechanisms, and here is why we think differently. It's certainly self-defeating, but it's safer. That's all, and I hope this makes sense of it. Now, I wrote that to an audience of what I thought was 100 people who knew me. Imagine how well it went when 12 million people read it. How dare you? How dare you have children when you were living in a weekly motel? How dare you? I had thousands of people within a week question every decision that I'd ever made based on those words and those words alone. And what was beautiful about my case, the reason I'm up here, was because I do respectability politics real well. I was married to a Marine with two beautiful daughters. I held down two jobs. He was working. I was going to school. Honey, if you'd caught me six months earlier, no, nah, I had one job and I hated it. wasn't in school. And if you'd caught me four months later, I never would have been able to maintain the workload for that long. There's no way you can keep that pace up. Oh, and the reason I was living in the weekly motel was because after my husband came home from Fallujah, we went to Cincinnati, and we put him in school, and the federal government decided not to pay his GI Bill out, so we moved to Cincinnati as soon as we got pregnant, thinking, here is that stable paycheck that you're supposed to have when you have kids, right? He's going to go to school right after he comes home from Iraq. He's going to become a full-time student. He's going to learn to become a father. And that is what we're going to do to put bread on the table. And then the checks never showed up. Five months later, I was working at a Burger King. He was working at a Burger King. We were part-time. We were living in the cheapest apartment we could find on the lowest level. And then there was a summer storm. Now, how nice do you assume the cheapest apartment in Cincinnati, Ohio is? Yeah, real well maintained, let me tell you. So when the summer storm hit and the drains hadn't been maintained and the water hit up to three feet in my house where we hadn't bought furniture yet and everything we owned got claimed by the water. Yeah, we were living in a weekly motel when I was pregnant the first time, but that story sounds a hell of a lot different if you're listening to the context, doesn't it? So they came for me and I went, no, 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 let's chat, guys. Let's really talk about this. Let's talk about deserving. Let's talk about the fact that my husband had already done his four years, got recalled to go to Fallujah because he had only ever signed up for the college money. Like the thing we keep hearing is, oh, there's not that many minimum wage jobs. Well, the minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. I worked for the Burger King Corporation for a year and a half, made it all the way up to, you ready? $7.45. <laughs> Ain't minimum wage though, right? So the trouble we're having with minimum wage in this country is there is no uniform minimum wage that's going to make sense. The Republicans are right. If we make it $15 an hour across the country, every small state is going to go down. Every small town goes down. But if it doesn't go up to at least 20, everybody in New York is hosed. You know what's really great? We already have a system for that. The way the military compensates its living structure is down to cost of living by zip code. So it's variable to the local economy. We could do that tomorrow. It's been working for 50 years already. And with very rare exception, like my husband, which that was actually the school screw up and not the government's, it works real well. We could put in a minimum wage tied to the cost of living by zip code and make sure everybody could live. What we keep getting caught in is 15 or 12 or 10 or what's best? What's best for everybody? Well, hell, honey, ain't nothing good for Cedar City that's good for San Francisco. Air, water, I mean a few things. <laughs> but politically speaking, no. We just make it variable, we already do it. It's like people talking about single payer. We can't figure out single payer. Dude, we've been doing single payer since the New Deal. We've just only been doing it for the elderly. Just expand it, yo, it's not that hard. But you would think it was moving mountains. So I mean, I think the question is more how do we frame it? How do we stop talking about what workers need and start talking about what they've contributed and what we've earned because again the CEO ain't doing his own laundry. Now how valuable do you think the CEO finds having clean shirts so he can make his next multi-trillion dollar business deal though? I would say that's added value and I would say that if the woman that cleaned his shirts didn't show up for work one day he'd sure feel the lack of her. So I think the conversation needs to change to what do we do for these people and what do they do for us? 
Ain't a person in America doesn't get a home mortgage tax deduction and roads that are cheaper than they should be and gas that's cheaper than it should be and foods that's cheaper than it should be. We have everything come to us subsidized courtesy of the United States taxpayer. So the question isn't, why are you offended at a poor person having something that you think you paid for? The question is, why the hell haven't I gotten my refund check from you? <laughs> this building, this company, this, this hotel, that gorgeous place, right? done with government loans on government subsidized land for less money than it would have cost to build. They have an artificially low tax rate because the city of New York thinks that it's a good idea to have this business here and so they don't tax them at full rate. So anybody that stayed at this hotel hasn't paid a full rate for their room, not fair market value, because the government's kicking in some money for it. You get a child tax deduction. You get a deduction on your home mortgage. You can write off a three martini lunch and a big ass steak for your business expenses, right? All of that is true. Find me the moral difference between that and food stamps, because if you're taking government money and we're being stingy, honey, I'm eating $2 burritos, you're eating a steak. Which of us is taking advantage of the United States taxpayer, I ask you? The idea of proletariat is not an American invention. It's human nature for us to look down and have an underclass and for us to feel like we're not very good and so somebody else has to be below us because that makes us at least not as bad as them. You're in a trailer park, well honey, at least I don't have six kids, I only have five. Those people are crazy. <laughs> that, it's human nature and, and it's our job, it's our job to be better than our nature and then you're getting into deep weeds philosophy and, 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 and how good are people. There is no way for a marginalized community to stand up and advocate on their own behalf without the community above them pushing back at it. It doesn't matter if you're poor, it doesn't matter if you're black, it doesn't matter if you're a woman, it doesn't matter. If you are being marginalized, if, if you are, are being gaslit, if you are being told that you are lesser than, well, then people in power have a, a, a real stake in making sure that that stays true. Because if they've been wrong about you this whole time, maybe they're wrong about how much better than you they are. And that's real hard for a lot of people to look at. We get ourselves ahead. We advocate for ourselves. We're the ones that figure out how to keep the bills paid, how to get the children cared for, how to get the next job. We're pretty savvy. We're pretty smart. What we don't ever have is somebody saying that they believe in us. And if you tell them, hey, I think you'll do great. I think this is important. And if you're willing, I'd like you to share your story so that other people don't feel so alone. I titled my presentation, she doesn't exactly help herself, does she? Because that's one of the most often repeated refrains about me in my work. I don't do respectability. I specifically do not do respectability. I smoke, I cuss, I drink, I have tattoos. Hey, I'm a human, just like everybody else. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you're getting drunk with your friends on Mickey's or whether you're drinking a fine bottle or Bordeaux. You're getting just as drunk. I have never heard of a poor person at a high-end sex club. I have never heard of a poor person with their own on-call shrink to bring them whatever benzodiazepines that they like. I'm pretty sure cocaine is an upper-class drug. So I want to know why is it that I am allowed to be uniquely judged? Why is it that when I say it sucks to be poor, it's okay for the entire world to question me, my morality, my intelligence, and my right to bear children? I had a Harvard professor write an article about how if I wanted to make the poor sympathetic, I would have used different terms about my own trauma. That went really well for her too. But the second anybody stands up and talks about themselves, when we self-advocate, CNN puts us up on TV and says, this woman's a fraud. In my death threat folder, right? I have a file that is autocorrect to send to four different governments 83 different police agencies, because if anything ever happens to me, I want law enforcement to know where to start. I said it sucked to be poor. I don't know how this is news, and I'm not sure why it's controversial. If it didn't suck to be poor, why would we all be trying so hard not to be? If it didn't suck to be poor, why would we be talking about jobs that nobody wants to do? 
And the question that I have for America is everybody can't be a CEO. Somebody is always going to have to bring us our food and clean up after us and scrub our toilets. And when in America did we decide that those jobs weren't worth dignity? Yeah. When you have clients that seem obstinate or angry or unwilling to talk to you, remember that we know what it is people are thinking in the backs of their heads. And even if you came out of poverty yourself, sweetheart, this was literally two years ago, just over two years ago, I have already forgotten what it's like to wake up with a migraine and a backache. I have already forgotten, and I thank God for it every single day, but the point is you have to remember that you have forgotten and that the people that you are blessed to work with have not had that luxury yet. So when your clients will not advocate for themselves, you need to understand I am the example that they are looking at of what will happen to them if they ever dare stand up. And if you find one that can, that will, that understands what the stakes are, my God, you treasure them and you coddle them and you hug them and you ask them if they're okay every single day because that is bravery. One of my favorite anecdotes actually from the first speech I gave, because oh my God, you guys, they did not, they literally picked me up out of the IHOP, said, hey, here's a viral firestorm, okay, go to the White House. It, it was like a two month process. I didn't know what I was doing. I got a chair, they had these, all these people with like TED Talks and they had interactive displays and they had like art projects and me, I got a stool, I stood up, I was like, hey, let me get this out of the way. My three favorite cuss words, all right, let's go. And I did a question and answer session for six hours. Because you got two kinds of people in the room, people who have been poor and people who have never been. And everybody's got questions. When I was describing the time, his, my boss shoved his hands down my pants and asked me which of the good shifts I wanted. I used a little bit of language describing that guy. Hadn't learned how to class it up yet. I got complaints about the way that I described that incident to people who were paying me money to come and bleed publicly for them so that they could all go home and feel like we learned something today. That is why they call me challenging now. But you guys work with us every single day. And the message over and over through my story, the message over and over is do not ever second guess your clients. Do not ever second guess somebody that feels wrong or feels too angry to help, my God, why wouldn't you be angry? Why would you not be angry trying to think of kinder words to discuss something like that so nobody else would feel bad for what happened to you? So this is the aftermath. Got a Guardian cover, an Observer cover, sold a book. My first thing, I got a new tattoo. Giant and visible. First visible tattoo I'd ever had because A, my Google search results were already screwed. If I was not going to get hired because of a tattoo, I was already not going to get hired. <laughs> this is the closest to natural my hair color has been since that date. But the reason I got the tattoos was so that I could never, ever, ever turn into one of those people. I am visibly marked. I have class markers that are impossible to take off now. And I am grateful for that every day because I was lucky enough to come up overnight. I never had to compromise. I never had to make a bargain. I never had to stop. It just here, now you're, now you're gonna be okay. And people got angry because they gave me that money, that GoFundMe money, I didn't ask for it. They started it. $30,000 showed up and people said, where do we put it? Called a friend of mine, he was like, put up one of those pages, I guess. And I was like, oh, okay, and I did. And it hit 60 in four days. I had to go on to Huffington Post Live in tears, begging people to stop giving me money because I knew now I was gonna have a book deal, I was gonna be okay. Please give it to a single mom. And people said, hey, why don't you get your teeth fixed straight up? Why'd you go get tattoos? Well, because I gave all the money to somebody that actually needed it. Because I knew I was gonna be okay. Took me a little bit longer to get that much money back in the door. It turns out I'm not very good with money. But the tattoos, you would have thought that I was killing puppies and small children. <laughs> Instead of spent $200 the first time, I made good. On myself. On something I wanted. With money that I had earned. 
at the end of the day, the story is this. I said it sucked to be poor. For some reason, they made me famous, and then they made me fairly wealthy by my rights, and now I literally travel around the country going, hey guys, did you know it sucks to be poor? <laughs> but more than that, more than that, I use this opportunity to travel across the country talking to folks like you, talking to people who are homeless, talking to people at all edges of the income spectrum. I go to Congress. I go to Parliament. Whatever is going to help, because the point is, we are all in this together, and it is our problem if we do not understand that with a quickness. We cannot have an underclass that continues to grow and a country that's going to be stable. We've got armed militants taking over federal reserves, black people shutting down freeways and cities. Nobody is being well served. When you hear the same thing out of a 15-year-old kid in St. Louis, and I have, I was in Ferguson, I have preferences on which chemical weapons my government uses against me. That's not a thing we should say. But from that experience, which, God, life-changing, tell me what? White girl from rural Utah? Here, Ferguson, learn about race relations. And then I go to Harney County, and I hear almost the exact same rhetoric from a 67-year-old rancher. That sense of disenfranchisement, that sense that the government is not doing, the sense that there is no we, it is us against them, it is not unless the us and the them are the people with power and the people without. And those of us in this room are the middlemen. It is our job to go and observe and to talk and to be sympathetic and then to take that information to the people above us and say, look, this is what America is and we will damn well do better. And if we can't do that, then we can at least do it in our own communities. When you have people at all spectrums, every part of, of every race, every gender, every creed, every whatever protected class, any way we can separate ourselves in any way that we have to self-separate for our own protection, and when every single group feels the same, we've got work to do, folks. So if any of you have stories, or know of people who have stories, or know of somebody that just needs a helping hand, you give them my email address. If there is work that I can be doing for your organizations, you call me. If there's work that anybody I'm tangentially related to can be doing for your organizations, you call me. It turns out I'm really good at walking into rooms full of rich people, making them feel horribly guilty, and then getting money for other organizations. <laughs> My life's work, because of my privilege, because I am young and white and intelligent and able-bodied, my life's work is to point out how privileged I am even when I was at the bottom. But I will be damned if another poor person in this country ever stands up for themselves and gets that. And it is your job. It is your job in this room to protect your clients from this, to make a safe space for us to talk about our own trauma without fear that we'll be further brutalized. Most people need a hug. Most people need empathy. Most people need caring. So when your clients get difficult, you remember, those people are me. And the only difference between them and me is some rich people somewhere said, she can string three words together. Let's get her a book deal. And then it turned out I was raw and challenging, and so they keep putting me on TV. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for your work.